you all. My name is Rosalind Shea, and it is my great pleasure to be here today. I'm actually a product of um, the education system here in the Bay Area. Um, so just out of my own curiosity, I was wondering if there's anyone here from the San Jose Unified School District. Okay, one person. Um, I'm a graduate of Leland High School, so, um, so it's my pleasure to, to be here. And in fact, one of my uh, favorite teachers from high school um, was my international relations and U.S. history teacher. And so um, I know the importance of education, and, um, and I, it's been um, so important to me, so I'm very happy to be here. Um, so today I'm going to be looking at um, policy analysis and looking specifically looking at economic policy in China today, especially in light of the um, new leadership um, in the last couple of years. And all the, the three different points that Tom had highlighted are actually very good organizing or analytical points for, um, for us today um, in terms of China, China's diversity, that China is not monolithic, in terms of um, uh, China's quest for wealth and power, certainly very important goals that um, are taken into account by the leadership in terms of coming up with economic policy, and also, obviously, politics. And um, I think it's what high school is organized quite well that many US government um, and um, history teachers actually also teach economics. Because as a political scientist and as someone who studies comparative political economy, we really can't disconnect politics and economics. And that is true in all countries in the world, but specifically in China, and prominently in China. So I like to often start my um, lectures with a map of China, and I was happy to see and happy to note that so many of you have actually been to China. So this is obviously not a new map to you, and for many of you who actually teaches um, world history and um, China in your, um, in your classes, this is not new to you as well. But as um, Tom had talked about, there's a lot of diversity geographically in China, um, and um, ethnic, religious, um, and also environmental diversity. Um, for most of us, when we think about China, the Chinese Communist Party, it sits very prominently in, in our heads. I think in part because we grew up during the Cold War era and um, you know, a time of democracy versus communism. For some of our students, perhaps um, made in China you know, tags on their clothes, um, on their electronic products is what actually um, signifies for them what is China today. Um, but I just want to note that the importance of the Chinese Communist Party um, in economic policy in China today, even as China opens up since 1978 to globalization. Um, my first book was actually about the relationship between China's globalization, the open door policy, market reforms, and the relationship to economic development in China. All the same, what I stress in my book is that, we, that the Chinese Communist Party and the political system, the institutions um, of, of the diversity of China still really matters today. So um, just as we focus on the fact that China is not monolithic, we should also um, keep in mind the importance of um, political institutions within China. And this is just an, um, kind of a, a, an outline overview of, um, of the complexity of even within the Chinese Communist Party. So even looking at one institution in China is not monolithic either. And then um, just a quick reminder, I'm sh this is, you could find this on the web very easily, but just the new leadership um, of the 18th Party Congress. Xi Jinping and Li Keqiang and, and some of these characters are often in the news. So today I want to focus on, in terms of looking at economic policy, to um, examine the third plenum of the 18th Communist Party Congress. And this uh, particular 13th um, plenum, uh, excuse me, third plenum, occurred um, last fall. And it's important, even though it may seem dated like, oh, well, it's only, it's been a year. The reason that we're going to focus on this particular set of pronouncements that came out of the third plenum is that throughout the ages, at different party congresses, the third plenum really gives us an, a, 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 a policy guideline 
of what is to come in the years to come for that particular um, set of leadership. So for Xi Jinping and his um, and, 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 and his um, comrades, we, the third plenum and some of the um, outcomes that came out of it, this third plenum, will be important to us. And I, what I'm also going to show later on is the importance of other third plenums and those, um, how those pronouncements gave us um, a hint of what was to come in these different eras of reform since 1978. And I want to focus on or zero in on one of the major pronouncements of the Third Plenum, which was strengthening of market forces. But what does that actually mean for um, substantive economic policy um, in China today and also going forward? And what that might have meant, this idea of market reform since 1978. Um, and, we're, and hopefully I will have time to apply um, some of these um, policies to important um, industries such as telecommunications. Um, earlier in, in the introduction, um, there was a mention of Tencent and then also Alibaba, which is going to have an IPO very soon. And those are companies within the telecommunications industry. And um, hopefully after this presentation, you will have some idea, how is it possible that the Chinese um, internet service provider, such as Alibaba, is now about to have the largest IPO in the world ever? Okay, so we've mentioned that China is not monolithic. So when we look at economic policy, what we really need to start with, like in almost any context in the world, is that it's important to think about stakeholders and the existing institutional context. And I think, at least for my undergraduates, and I believe this will be true for high school students too, is to talk about, um, to, to, to to introduce to them this, these kind of conceptual ideas of, well, we need to think about, well, who are the winners and who are the losers? And who are going to endure the costs of changes? And who are going to be um, the bearers of these costs? And why would they necessarily become losers or winners? And why they would might resist certain policy changes? And why would there be certain policy changes? What are some of the goals? of um, the state or the government or the different um, stakeholders of um, a policy change. Are there hierarchies in some of these goals? Um, uh, our earlier speakers have alluded to some of these different goals, right? We have um, political legitimacy, environmental sustainability. These are all very important goals. But which goals are more important than others? and in which areas? These are all important questions, um, really, we could apply to almost any context in the world. But in China's very unique political system and institutional context, these goals are very important to think about. And what are some of the international or environmental economic changes that might affect these goals and the hierarchies of these goals? And how have some the answers to these questions shifted over time? especially since China's open door policy in 1978. So I've mentioned already who makes policy. I kind of alluded to some of that by introducing um, the idea of the Chinese Communist Party. But there are other stakeholders that are actually quite important. And this is where the fact that China is not monolithic becomes very important. And we also have path-dependent stakeholders. Once you open up, once the 1978 open door policy occurs, and all the different introduction of market forces occurred in the 1980s, we're going to have new stakeholders. And once you, once you introduce certain reforms, we're going to have new stakeholders. And with these new stakeholders, there might be differences and changes in some of the state goals. And of course, there are going to be social economic conditions, right? And um, we have the, uh, for example, in the East Asian crisis of the late 1990s, um, there are stakeholders that came out of that. The companies and industries that might have benefited from some of the policies that the Chinese government um, instituted during that time to um, promote and develop the economy, those new stakeholders will have a say today, 15 years later. 
And how about when China uh, became a World Trade Organization member in 2001, right? Major introduction of competition. New stakeholders were formed, including foreign direct investors. And foreign direct investors who are now part of the vibrant industries that now exist in China will also be some of those stakeholders. And in terms of the actual content and policy, we have um, state industry relations, but then there are also actual methods. Sometimes um, you could have particular goals, but the methods might look very differently across industries. For example, economic development is a very important goal in any country, whether it's a democracy or an authoritarian regime. But a method of um, reaching that very important economic development goal is going to look very different depending on the um, institutional context of the country. I just want to really quickly, before I dive into some of the more details of, um, of the goals and industry relations and methods I'm going to talk about, um, these are just some suggested readings if you are interested in um, reading further about um, China's economic policy. And we go back to um, the 1980s era, the 2000s, and also um, some of the more recent work on, 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 on China. And of course, a lot of these perspectives will differ on how exactly, how pluralistic is China actually, it, that China actually is, right? I talked about stakeholders. But the different stakeholders, that may not look the same as the pluralism that we actually see in democracies. So the fact that China is monolithic, or is not monolithic, doesn't mean that government industry relations or government in interest group relations actually operate similarly to um, a democracy like ours. Um, so there will be different perspectives. For example, Scott Kennedy's book of the business of lobby in China. And already by the title, we could um, tell that he you know, takes a perspective that lobby is actually um, increasingly significant in China, which means that that's a perspective of believing that there's more pluralism in China than maybe some other author in here. But this, these are just kind of a set of different um, perspectives on um, economic policy in China and also globalization. I um, had forwarded an article in Business Week from November of last year that I thought did actually a pretty good job laying out some of the paradoxes and contradictions of the third plenum. Um, I don't know if you guys had a chance to read it. I, we won't have much time to go over um, all, um, the, the details of it, but I'm going to talk about some of the, uh, the goals. Okay. So really quickly about the third plenum of the 18th Communist Party Congress. Um, well, we obviously we have it presided over by Xi Jinping, and um, the major economic relevant document that came out of this particular um, communique was the decision on major issues concerning comprehensively deepening reforms. That very grandiose title sounds like, wow, there's going to be a lot of markets that's going to be introduced in China. We're going to see competition, and perhaps we're even going to see reforms that may bring China closer and closer to the liberal economic model. And some of the announced goals are, and you will see that some of these goals may be contradictory to each other, but very importantly, we have um, national security with emphasis on internal security. And um, Tom had already mentioned political corruption is very important, conflict among ethnic minorities, and then also social discontent. So uh, managing national security is a very important Manage social and environmental consequences of reform, which um, a big part of, of the workshop the next two days will be dealing with. And then finally, to continue to foster and promote innovation and global competitiveness of state-owned industry. And this idea of a mixed economy. China is going to have private industry, private um, markets, but the state-owned economy is going to continue to stay um, quite strong. And um, my reading of it is that there will be continued state intervention on the industries that the government considers important. And those industries are most likely going to be industries that will have some national security implications, that will have uh, uh, implications about the innovation of China's national technology base. Right? Those are going to be related to some of the goals announced in the third um, plenum communique. 
and some of the announced methods, law, as defined by the Chinese. Right? Tom mentioned that legalism is actually a tradition that's been in China for a long time. It's nothing new. But is it ruled by law or is it rule of law? Right? We know um, uh, in the United States and in a lot of um, democracies, it's rule of law. But in China, it could be rule by law, which is that um, quite different. And then we have the State Security Committee. This actually, this particular formation of this committee um, had um, actually garnered a lot of uh, media attention throughout the world. So you might have read about the formation of the State Security Committee. And what's interesting is that um, the focus of the State Security Committee um, has been um, unsurprisingly very much about internal security, whether it's about political corruption within the Communist Party or about the ethnic um, conflict that we see sprouting across different parts of China. And then importantly, and perhaps in some contradiction, there is a leading group to strengthen market forces. And that's gonna be um, important for economic policy. But I would proffer that actually all um, the different announced methods are going to touch what economic policy will look like. So security goals are gonna be just as important as about goals of strengthening market forces. And so just this really quickly um, to kind of give you a perspective about um, how the other third plenum of Chinese Communist Party Congresses um, have given us, in a sense, a guideline of what was to come um, in terms of actual substance of economic policy. So we have in 1978 the announcement of the reform and opening policy, which really has made a huge difference in the last 40 years. Um, and then in the Jiang Zemin era, um, in 1993, there was a stage for macro liberalization, but as I found in my own research, that there's been micro level re-regulation. So you're opening of the economy uh, on the macro level, but really on the sector specific level, we do see certain strictures that might actually contradict market reform or, mar or, or the introduction of competition. Um, and then we have, um, in the late 1990s, actually state entrenchment. So there was a lot of rhetoric and talk about um, market reforms, but in fact, in response to the East Asian financial crisis, there was state retrenchment to protect certain industries, especially state-owned industries that weren't doing well because of the East Asian financial crisis. And you know, we saw some of that in 2008 as well in response to the global financial crisis a decade later. Um, and then during the Hu Jintao era, we um, have uh, the, um, the announcement of regulation of private enterprises. And the result of that is what? Now in China today, we do have private enterprises or quasi-private enterprises, so like Huawei in telecoms equipment or um, Alibaba in um, uh, internet service provision. quickly skip over this. The existing institutional context, this is important because while these announced goals are, um, are there, we have to think about what are some of the institutional contexts. Okay, well we have de facto private property. We have decentralization. This is very important because one of the major stakeholders are local governments. Local governments are going to be affected by any introduction of market forces. And a lot of these market reforms are actually happening at the local levels. And so that means local governments are gonna be most affected potentially on tax revenue basis. If introduction of competition will erode tax revenue basis, then who are gonna be some of the losers? Probably local governments. And what might they do? They might, on one hand, implement market reforms, but on the other hand, um, take steps towards um, making the informal economy more vibrant. And so then you're gonna have contradictions that might occur, or at least um, resistance to some of the actual enforcement of market reforms. And then of course, any global economic slowdown will be, um, will, will uh, pertain, uh, play a role. Environmental consequences of modernization will be important. And the stakeholders, we talked about the Chinese Communist Party, state council, the various central level ministries and bureaucracies, state research organs, owners and managers of capital, banks, local banks, central level banks, 
um, consumers, citizens. And so in many ways, um, China has just as many stakeholders as um, in any con context. But the important is, well, what are some of the existing powers of these stakeholders? And what, what are the spaces that they have in actually being able to um, reveal their preferences to the very central level? Which is why I still emphasize the importance of the Chinese Communist Party and also some of the top leadership of the Chinese Communist Party. Because they have to balance these different interests. At the same time, these different interests do not actually are always able to uh, voice their interests. And of course, most importantly, now security, internal security, and party legitimacy and the integrity of the party is going to be very important. So that's why in the media today, we hear a lot about political corruption. That's what Xi Jinping is focusing his energies on. But wait, what happened to all the market reforms that were announced in the fall of last year? Are they on the table? Are they being stopped or are they ongoing? But how do they actually uh, reconcile with a lot of these um, political reforms within the party. Okay, I don't have much time, but I just um, want to really quickly talk about um, a lot of these reforms have really made China today as a, into a very, in many aspects, a very modern, um, industrially developed um, country. And telecoms is one area that China has done has um, introduced a lot of different types of reforms, but at the same time also retained a lot of economic control, uh, excuse me, political control over to address what? That goal of national security. And so um, today we have all the state-owned carriers, um, uh, all the, the major carriers like Ver uh, Verizon or AT&T, they're all still state-owned. What does that mean? That means that the Chinese government could continue to retain um, control of information. You can shut down China telecoms at any time. I mean, most recently, you know, as Americans, we've been all up in arms about hearing about what, um, you know, uh, what the what the what our government have been telling our telecom carriers to do, right? To hand over certain private information. Well, in China, there wouldn't even be any debate on that. There wouldn't even be resistance because all the carriers are owned by the state. But there's a lot of competition between the state-owned carriers. They are responsible to generate their own revenue. They compete with each other on policy and on different services are being provided. So what is that an example of? That is market reform. That is the introduction of market forces. China, Chinese telecoms is becoming more and more efficient. But at the same time, the goal of national security is retained. This is why I like um, looking at telecoms because it's a great example of how the Chinese government manages you know, with all the different issues that needs to be balanced, to some extent, you know, not perfectly, to develop industry to be somewhat innovative and, and, um, and highly developed compared to other parts of the world, but at the same time manages to retain um, some of the very important security goals. And, okay, the most recent, um, out of the, uh, the most recent third plenum, is this <coughs> example of internet security and information Informationization leading group. So we've heard about cybersecurity, right? Well, before there was one leading group on in, um, on informationization, which you know dealt with a lot of control of information purposes, helped with you know came up with policy, specific micro level policies about um, um, regulating the telecoms industry. But now, internet security has become important for various reasons, and now there is, in a way, more hierarchy in regulating the telecoms industry. And this leading group is an example of it, merging different state bureaucracies together to make policy making in this particular industry more efficient. And efficiency, what is that? That is a market method, right? At the same time, we're also retaining state security concerns as um, an important goal. Okay, we don't have much time, I really need to end, but <laughs> as Tom had warned you, we sometimes, as academics, talk too bit much. I just want to really quickly to talk about another industry, which is textiles. No, not much state security concerns at all, right? Well, this is an example where China has actually really let go of an industry. To an extent, there is overproduction, 
there's over um, expansion. There probably, you know, contributes to the environmental issues that we see in China today. Because why? There's just not much state capacity um, devoted to regulating this industry. China really has let go of this industry. This is an example of lots of markets. Maybe lots of too much market reform to a point that there isn't enough hierarchies at all. Um, so we do see, to some extent, in Chinese economy today, this kind of bifurcated picture of a very centralized state capitalism, or on the other hand, this other picture of lots of markets, lots of stakeholders, almost too much, without real enforcement of even laws that are existing in the books today. So anyway, I'm gonna have to wrap up, but um, hopefully this kind of gives you a, a better um, idea of how economic decision-making and policy is um, constructed in China today. Thank you.